I think the most, uh, the longest period I slept in um, 32 days was two hours. Even more so with solo sailing, fatigue is a very dangerous aspect um, because then you can mess up and a mess up at sea, especially if you're alone, could mean your death. So how do you go about doing that, right? Like, do you have to just be alert 24 hours a day the entire time that you're going? Generally, on my passage, the way I do it when I'm when I'm at sea and I'm not coastal cruising is at, I would start my night shift around 9 p.m. And I would set an alarm for the top of the hour for every hour. And um, I would lay down, hopefully sleep through the hour. And then my alarm goes off. I would get up, go on deck, look for ships, slowly s scan the horizon, check the sails, check the course, make sure I'm still going the right direction and um, carry on my way. And um, there's a thing called uh, a wind vane self-steering system, which is all mechanical. doesn't take any electronics. And it, um, you basically, you set your course and you activate this wind vane and um, it steers the boat for you. So it removes you from having to hand steer the boat. But you wouldn't ever want to like just sleep for eight hours straight with the boat going like, all right, well, I pointed it east. It's not a good idea. <laughs> Because usually the sea conditions change, the wind conditions change, and um, so your winds are, your sails might, you know, backwind, you start pointing in the wrong direction. You know, it's like you're sailing eight hours in the wrong direction is not going to help your final cause. So um, I think the most, uh, the longest period I slept in um, 32 days was two hours. What does that do to your body? Um, I lost 20 pounds. <laughs> Um, also the conditions at sea, it's really hard to cook. So you kind of eat pretty, pretty simply. Um, and then, yeah, you get into a rhythm with it because it's not just nighttime. So like, I don't drink any caffeine when I'm at sea. Like I don't have coffee. I love coffee on land and, and when I'm like, you know, just near shore, but I don't drink any caffeine when I'm at sea so that in the middle of the day, if I can lay down, then I can sleep, you know, so you just kind of grab rest wherever you are. So for somebody who's like never been out on the open ocean, what's, what's it like compared to like, how is the open ocean different from being near shore? Well, for one thing, you can be rescued near shore. Yeah. Um, that's like, you know, in the middle of the ocean, there is no rescue or, or if you're lucky, you might get rescued by a cargo ship, but then you, your vessel or your home or your boat has to be sunk so that it's not a danger to other boats navigating in the same waters. Um, so that thought, you know, it's not like a helicopter can just come pick you up when you're a thousand miles from shore. So that is wildly different. Um, but on the flip side of that is there's nothing more dangerous to a boat than the shore. So when, like when I'm navigating close to shore, if I'm doing overnight passages, like nonstop overnight passages, I'll sleep in the cockpit outside um with my alarm set for every 15 minutes because that's about 20 minutes is about the time a ship will reach you from the horizon if it's traveling at full speed so about every 15 minutes you pop up look around for ships and then lay back down um, and even with ais because a lot of small fishing boats don't have that and if somebody's on that boat not on watch they're on autopilot they could easily run you down so and sailboats do not move very fast you know because it is right around the pace of like walking swiftly or walking slowly, depending on the wind. But I mean, that's it. That's as fast as you're going. You're only going like three or four miles an hour. Oh yeah. Even if the wind's like whipping, you're still yeah, just so like poking the, around. The whole, the whole speed on my boat, I think is like seven knots, which is like, you know, it's not one for one for like miles per hour, but um, it's not very fast. Yeah. And it's like, that's, yeah, I, and I mentioned that I said, you know, like my passage here from Los Angeles would have been the equivalent to me driving from Los Angeles to Pittsburgh at three miles an hour, basically. I thought you were going a lot faster than that. I assume that like, all right, you nope. get out in the open ocean, they're probably doing like 30 or 40. You're doing like five. But that's like those giant cargo ships, they max out at 30 knots. Why didn't I think that everything was so much faster? Yeah, but like fancy race boats. Like for the America's Cup, they have these boat, these sailboats that look like spaceships almost. Those things will go like 40 knots or, you know, those those things are totally bananas. But they don't go long distances really at that speed, you know. I have never but, understood why it's knots and not just miles per hour. Back in the age of sail, the way they would determine the speed of the ship is they had a log 
that was tied to a rope and the rope had at specific lengths had knots tied in it and they would turn hourglass over throw the log in and then count how many knots went through their hand until the hourglass ran out and then they would write down how many knots in the log book that makes perfect sense you know for like the water conditions out on the open ocean is it smoother is it wavier is that the right word like what's it yeah, like it, well it all depends on almost everything depends on the wind so the swells generally if there's no wind they're very long rollers so the the swells are long and you know it's like long swells are not dangerous so i've sailed in you know 20 foot seas in the north atlantic but they were long periods and they so they're not breaking waves so they're not scary they're intense to see 20 feet hill of water behind you and then suddenly you're on top of it and then the captain who taught me to sail in scotland celia bull she told me about she sailed to antarctica done cape horn all the stuff she sailed to south georgia on a boat as crew and she saw 60 foot waves in the north uh, southern ocean where there were 60 foot mountain you know, mountain 60 foot tall mountains of water and then they were on top of a 60 foot mountain of water looking down into the trough 60 feet so if they're long period and they're not breaking then they're not dangerous but here in the pacific the it's um it's a very calm ocean primarily other than like if you're in a hurricane track or if you're in the north pacific and if basically it's like it, any ocean in the correct season is fine if you're out of the if you're sailing in waters in the wrong season it's not fine but the pacific is very mild compared to the atlantic and that's because the atlantic is especially specifically like the caribbean stuff is so the water so shallow that it supercharges these storms and that's when all the hurricanes happen there but there we don't have like hurricanes in los angeles so when you look kind of forward and and then like the and the goal of what's the word circumnavigating like is there a spot where you're like ooh I'm not ready for this place yet, or this is going to be, um, this is going to be the test. Yeah. Cape Horn, the, the, my eventual goal, I planned around Cape Horn, which is the most dangerous place in the world. And it's killed thousands and thousands of sailors over the years. Um, eventually all around Cape Horn. And it just depends. And that's the place where you just have to have all your ducks in a row. And, and a number of small boats have done it. And again, it's like, waiting out weather windows you know and not you know that's a lot of it is like waiting for weather um but with today's technology it's easier to know what weather is going to be so it's easier to sort of like know what you're getting yourself into um but yeah that cape horn will be the spot that's like and uh, the indian ocean too but crossing the indian ocean from southeast asia to africa will be um a challenge but again it's a matter of like going in the right season why is that such a what what makes that place such a, a rough rough area yeah i don't i don't know probably i'm not specifically educated on that fact or, or that reason but i would guess it it's in relation to to like africa and the land masses around there that just creates you know like these storms that are pretty gnarly the indian ocean is pretty gnarly um so yeah i would just imagine it's weather systems that are in relation to the Southern Ocean on one side and Africa, the African continent on the other side.